I want to, uh, I want to thank you, and I mean this sincerely, uh, um, for your dedication, dedicating your entire career. That's not hyperbole. Your entire career uh, uh, to the cornerstone of this democracy, and that is uh, the rule of law. Um, there's a reason why so many, you're the longest serving, and so many uh, presidents have turned to you. Um, you have unimpeachable integrity. You have a brilliant mind, and uh, you uh, you have a uh, you've demonstrated a, just an unyielding commitment uh, to the document that you uh, helped uh, interpret or enforce uh, by arguing for the government. And so I want to thank you for the service of the country, but. Equally as importantly as Ron can tell you and others who work with me, uh, I, I, I judge the genuineness, of, I mean this sincerely, the genuineness of a man or a woman with whom I've served either in appointed or elective office by how they conduct themselves when they leave that office to find out whether it was real or whether it was for some political gain. And your continued commitment to the rule of law, your involvement in this organization, which is, I realize uh, its tenure is not as long as the other outfit. Um, <laughs> but is, but by the way, we talked about it early on, is badly needed. You are badly, badly, badly needed. And you're filling, no, it really is important. I, I know it sounds like I'm just trying to be, I'm not, I, I genuinely mean it. The problem is no one ever doubts that I mean what I say. But the, but the problem is I sometimes say all that I mean, uh, and, uh, and I mean it. You are, you are really very, very much needed, and, uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, the role you play. Um, it is true, uh, I was, uh, I came back from law school uh, 812 years ago, in 1968, and my city, part of it had been burned to the ground. The city of Wilmington, Delaware is the only city in America since the Civil War occupied by the military for a total of uh, nine months. It's National Guard with drawn bayonets, federal on every single corner in my city. And uh, I, uh, I, was, I, was, I had terrible grades in law school, but I was a pretty good uh, Communicator. Um, I won the International Moot Court competition, a few other things, and uh, I talked myself into getting a job with a, quote, white shoe law firm that was uh, the oldest law firm in the state of Delaware. And after a case in federal court, which and it was a firm, fine firm, where we de were we defending uh, a major oil company, um, and we won, and I had written as before I got admitted to the bar. Those days you took the bar in September, it's still that way in Delaware. You take it in September, you don't get your results until December, it's given once a year. And But I was sitting in the second chair with a senior partner, I wrote uh, a brief for a directed verdict in this case, and we won. And, uh, um, and it was reason to celebrate, uh, but I looked over at the defendant and I thought, oh God, you know, we we, we upheld the law, but this poor kid is in real bad shape. He was injured uh, cleaning out a containment vessel with an oil company. And uh, the senior partner, who was a good man, uh, DuPont, uh, invited me to go to lunch at the Wilmington Club. Uh, that is in Delaware. Uh, there were no Catholics or blacks or Jews allowed in that club, and it was considered a great honor for me to go to the Wilmington Club. I demurred and I walked out of the courtroom and walked across Rodney Square. If any of you had the corporate cases in Delaware, you know what I mean, across from the federal courthouse. Went to the basement of a, cat, a building that was Caddy Corner, walked into the public defender's office, a guy named Frank Kearns. And I said, Frank, I'd like to come to work for the public defender's office. He said, don't you work for Prickett? I said, yes. He said, are you crazy? <laughs> um, from that moment on, my judgment has been questioned by everyone <laughs> in the state of Delaware. Uh, you think I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, um, and <laughs> but I learned early on, man, what you've all learned. 
There's a lot of people who are successful and not happy. If you want to be successful and happy, um, work like hell and do what you believe in. And, uh, and that's what all of you do. And that's why you're involved in this. Apparently, I have not made many bones about it. I am a fan of Elizabeth Warren. She's a great personal friend. And I missed her speech for you before you tonight. But I got to see her outside um, before we left. And we, uh, we, we compared notes and, uh, on a number of things. Um, <laughs> and she told me, just go up and say thank you and leave. Uh, but, uh, Look, I know you asked me uh, here tonight to speak about the unprecedented dysfunction that the Senate is literally spreading to a third branch of government, our highest court. But there is a fundamental issue that I'd like to raise uh, briefly, uh, uh, which I think is related uh, to the issue, um, before I begin specifically on uh, the refusal to hold a hearing for uh, Chief Judge Merrick Garland. And that is that I believe that, and I have not been one, and Ron can tell you, I'm not really big on um, engaging in, even if it's justified, attacking another, uh, uh, an opponent in a campaign or being negative, but we've, we've sort of crossed the line here. The Republican presidential nominee, I believe, and I mean this literally, this is not a political point, I think his conduct is literally undermining and threatening and potentially doing damage to the constitutional imperative of an independent judiciary that the American people can have faith in. It matters. It matters that the people have faith in the impartiality of the court. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 78, he said, the complete independence of the courts of justice is a peculiarly essential, is peculiarly essential in a limited, for a limited constitution. To guarantee that independence, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, to protect against political pressure, the framers included the emoluments clause, the compensation clause, which restricts the ability of either branch of government to reduce the judge's compensation while they're in office, life tenure, removal only by impeachment, and a supermajority impeachment in the United States Senate. Pretty, pretty bold and provocative at the time statements of we expect this branch of government to be co-equal, independent, and it's essential that it's believability. There's confidence of the people. It's like Mussolini's comment, how many battalions, does the, how many regiments does the Pope have? Well, you know, what does the court have? What does it have? It has its reputation that it is, in fact, it is, in fact, impartial. That is, in fact, prepared to rule on the merits. That it is not subject to intimidation. That's a precious, precious, precious commodity that in our separation of powers, the court cannot afford to have undermined. All these protections were designed to do two things. Reinforce in the minds of the public the absolute impartiality of the federal judiciary, the Supreme Court in particular, and protect the federal judiciary from being able to be influenced by either of the political branches. The framers gave concrete substance to the idea that Ours is, as Chief Justice Marshall said, put it, a government of laws and not of men. It sounds, it, it sounds almost like a, a, a high school civics class, but it's real. It's consequential. It really matters. Look at the lengths even a divided court has gone to 
over our history on extremely divisive subjects to make sure, even though they had enough votes, to get a preponderance beyond a single vote so that they would say to the country, this is the law of the land. You know, uh, the fact is that um, the, uh, one of the, found the founding fathers, in my view, did not think to quote a perceptive commentator who wrote just a couple days ago. The federal courts, litigation in the federal courts is not deal making by another means. Surely the framers of our Constitution did not envision a presidential candidate of one of the major political parties personally attacking a sitting federal judge as the nominee or the presumptive nominee of a major party, attacking a federal judge because that judge ruled against the candidate in his private capacity as a citizen in a civil case. For a candidate to call a judge a hater, a total disgrace, to quote him, because he allowed people claiming to have been victimized by the candidate in his capacity as a private businessman to proceed, and because the judge dares to unseal some documents, which is in his power to do, detailing their victimization, I don't think the framers envisioned a presidential candidate accusing a judge of being incapable of reaching a fair decision because of his ethnic descent, because he was Hispanic or anything else, because he was from Tennessee. Mr. Trump isn't unique in attempting to intimidate the federal judiciary in the case. Other private citizens have tried to pressure the judiciary from time to time, but not private citizens who are placed in close range of the White House by one of our great political parties. It's one thing for a private citizen to attempt to throw his economic or political weight around as an unelected official, to try to influence, help him, demolish his adversary, a phrase often used by this particular fellow, in a judicial proceeding. It's quite another thing for the presumptive candidate of a major party to do the same thing. And up to now, you may say, well, Joe, and folks, I have not been out responding to, in my capacity as vice president, to anything that Mr. Trump has said. But it's my view that a presidential candidate who publicly attacks a sitting federal judge who ruled in a way that was against his own economic interests cannot be trusted to respect the ind independence of the judiciary as a president. Again, you may view this as... I'm sure for those who are saying, and with good reason, well, I think that's a particularly harsh judgment but there's no real connection here. Let's look at what that presumptive nominee said, his own words. After calling the judge presiding over a fraud suit against him a total disgrace, Mr. Trump said, and I quote, these are his exact words, but, quote, but we will come back in November wouldn't that be wild if I'm president and I come back and do a civil case? He went on to say, and I'm quoting, wouldn't it be wild as president to come back in November to do a civil case? How can that be interpreted in any other way than as a direct threat these are words of someone 
who sees our federal judiciary not as an independent branch of government, but as a tool for him to manipulate so he can do what he calls deal with the laws of our country. These are words, in my view, of one who would defy the courts if they ruled against him as president. Not just in a business case, but a case challenging government abuse of power. 